I'm grateful to uh, your premier, to the minister, uh, for bringing me here as a thinker in residence to Gabe Kelly and to uh, uh, St. Peter's College for their hospitality. Um, I'm going to explore today the proposition that uh, uh, Minister Portolese started with. What is the relationship between well-being and learning? And I'm going to end by articulating a possible vision for South Australia. The intuition behind the relationship between well-being and learning, um, just think about a baby. When you scare a baby, when a baby feels abandoned, when a baby is angry, she falls back on what she already knows. When a baby is secure and happy, that's when she explores the world. And that's when learning occurs. And that's the basic intuition on, uh, about which I'm going to be talking today. Uh, it's not always been obvious to educators that, that children should be happy. In fact, um, the, the, the venerable medical model out of which psychology arises from Freud and before Freud, Schopenhauer, was the view that the best we could ever do in life was to minimize our suffering. So life was remedial, aimed at bringing misery as close to zero as possible. And embedded in my remarks today is the notion that I believe that's empirically false, morally obtuse, and politically a dead end. So I'm going to talk about the possibility that we can, we can hope for much more in the lives of our children than not to suffer. And uh, when, when you lie in bed at night, you're for the most part not thinking about how to go from minus 5 to minus 2. You're thinking about how to go from plus 3 to plus 6. Well, in the last 20 years of science has arisen about how to go from plus 3 to plus 6. And so it's Although it's commonly said in Australia, in the UK, in the United States, that our children will not be economically as well off as we are, I don't know whether or not that's true, there is enormous room for our children to have better well-being than we do. And that's the vision I'm going to present today. So here's an outline of what I'm going to talk about. I just said what we could most hope for our children. We can hope for well-being. We can hope for a lot of stuff above zero. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about, is well-being buildable? Can it increase? Or is it like your waistline? Dieting, as you probably know, is a scam. Uh, any of you can lose 5% of your body weight in about three weeks by following any diet on the bestseller list. The problem about dieting is that in three to five years, uh, 80 to 95% of you will regain all that weight or more. And so the question is, is increasing well-being like that, in which we just revert back to where we were, or can well-being genuinely be built? So um, I'm going to take you through uh, the question of what is well-being uh, and how to build it. So at the individual level, I'm going to contend that well-being consists of five elements, PERMA. P, positive emotion, E, engagement, R, good relationships, M, meaning, and A, accomplishment. And then I'm going to take you briefly through uh, one example of research that's going on today in each of those five areas in which positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishment are built at the individual level. So I'll take you through each of those. And then I'll ask the question that brings us here today, uh, is positive education possible? Can we do this at a school level? And I'm going to tell you about what's going on in the world in positive education. Uh, and then I'm uh, going to talk about uh, examples of integrating positive psychology into the classroom. So one could have the view that positive psychology is sort of a standalone course, like music or rugby. But I have the view that the principles of positive psychology interweave with literature, with biology, with history. And I'll just give you some examples of how that might be so. Um, and I, I'll tell you the story of positive psychology having been taught in a positive education model in uh, uh, a huge organization, the entire United States Army, 
And uh, then I'll close with a vision for uh, South Australian education. Uh, so that's what we'll do. Uh, so uh, to my mind, let me say what a flourishing adult or a flourishing child has. Not just the absence of misery, but the, it's a real thing. It's the presence of five things. So the first is positive emotion, joy, comfort, happiness. Um, I want to make sure you don't mistake positive psychology for the smiley face. So one of the five elements of positive psychology is smiling and being cheerful and being merry and being happy. But it's very important that you know that uh, cheerfulness is normally distributed in the human population. And that means that there are three billion people in the world right now who don't feel happy or merry or cheerful. And the second thing to know, cheerfulness is strongly uh, genetically based. It's about 50% heritable. And what that means to those of us who work on, I'm, I'm by the way in the lower half of positive affectivity, and uh, uh, by the way I take my own medicine generally, so each of the exercises that I'll be telling you about are things that are first, if it works on me, I try it, then I give it to my wife and seven children, if it works on them I give it to my graduate students, if it works on them we start to do clinical trials on it. Um, so. Uh, uh, what I think we have with the P, the smiley face, is about 15% leverage. And that means if you're uh, a uh, low positive affective, prone to depression and pessimism, there's about 10 to 15. I, I know tricks to get you to live in the upper part of a set range. Uh, and it's uh, the genetics and the distribution of positive emotion that uh, tells me that positive psychology is not a happyology. It's about engagement as well. The, the question of when time stops for you, when you are one with the music, uh, when you're in flow. And um, we know something about that now. Mike Cheek sent me high, is a leader in this field. Flow occurs, learning occurs in the classroom and elsewhere when your highest strengths are just matched to the highest challenges that come your way. And that notion says we need to know what children's highest strengths are. And I'll tell you something about that, uh, as well as teachers' highest strengths in about 15 minutes. The third element of positive psychology is good relationships. And uh, there, some of you are blessed with knowing how to bring off good relations. But good relations are a skill, and it turns out there have been discoveries in the last decade about that skill, discoveries that tell us we can teach good relationships to our children. The fourth element is meaning, belonging to and serving something you think is bigger than the self. The self is an impoverished site for meaning, but human beings, I believe, ineluctably search for meaning. I believe human beings have not only been individually selected, a la Dawkins, but also group selected. And that human beings are hive creatures, just like termites and wasps and bees. And I'll say more about that later. Uh, the final element of flourishing for a child or an adult is achievement, accomplishment, mastery, and competence. So that's the, the theoretical backbone of this. And positive psychology as a discipline says psychology should be just as concerned with the strengths of children as their weaknesses. Now, one thing I want to make sure you understand, uh, I am not suggesting that we replace psychology as usual, the psychology of alleviating suffering and misery with positive psychology. I'm suggesting this is a complement to it. It's another arrow in the quiver. Psychology, as usual, has been about going from minus eight to minus three. And uh, I think in addition, uh, we've learned quite a bit about how to go from plus two to plus five. But I think we should be proud of our, the work we've done with weakness, and my suggestion is we need to work explicitly on strength as well. Secondly, we should ju be just as interested in building what makes life worth living as we are in repairing what the worst things in life are. 
Uh, we should be just as concerned with normal people, with you, your children, your students, as we are with healing pathology. And finally, uh, we should develop interventions, and that will be the bulk of my talk today, that increase well-being, not only interventions that decrease suffering. Again, I want to reiterate that I am all for the interventions that decrease suffering. I've spent my whole life working on those, but there's something new here. There are interventions that actually increase well-being, and they have as side effects the decrease of suffering. So what I want to do now is take you in about 12 minutes through PERMA, and I think what I'm going to do here is tell you one thing about the science of positive psychology that uh, your grandmother didn't know. Some people, uh, you might think that your minister and your grandmother knew all this stuff before, but there are actually about 20 things that I didn't know 15 years ago that have been discovered. And then I want to tell you one thing we know about how to reliably build uh, each of the five elements. So starting with PERMA, positive emotion, uh, uh, let me talk about smiling. Okay, I'm a photographer. Smile. Uh, smile. O okay. Uh, uh, about, there are two kinds of smiles. There is a Duchenne smile, which is a genuine smile, and you can tell it by the muscles underneath the eyes. You can't tell it by the lips. Uh, and there is a stewardess smile. Uh, these are people who smile for a living. It's called a non-Duchenne smile. And in about five minutes, I could teach any of you how to go through pictures in, a, uh, in the newspaper and, and uh, identify whether or not the person was engaged in a genuine smile or a, a, a non-Duchenne smile. In 1970, the entire freshman class at Mills College was asked by the photographer to smile, and they did, and a, the yearbook was published, and half of them were displaying a Duchenne smile, and half of them were displaying an artificial smile. Uh, Thirty years later, researchers from Berkeley called them up and asked them, how many divorces have you had? And it turned out that uh, uh, statistically, the women who were engaged in an artificial smile had more divorces, less marital satisfaction, and less life satisfaction. It's just one of the snapshots of uh, the relationship of a snapshot of positive emotion to what goes on in life. Um, I spend a lot of time predicting how long people are going to live. Uh, there's a, a great interest in uh, under what conditions do people die prematurely and what is the psychological relationship of this. And people in uh, Utah live longer than people in Nevada. That is a typical finding in this literature. Uh, well, people in Nevada uh, drink all night, they have drug addiction, they have sexual, sexual diseases, uh, they don't believe in God. People in Utah uh, get up at dawn and go to sleep at sunset. They don't drink. They believe in God. Uh, I have a t-shirt that says, uh, uh, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you may be in Utah. Uh, <laughs> so it's no surprise that people in Utah live longer than people in Nevada. Uh, so in order to do serious work on uh, who lives long, you need a homogeneous group of people who don't stay up partying all night, who don't get sexually transmitted diseases, who believe the same thing, who have good medical care. And so there's an exemplary study of nuns. And uh, uh, one aspect of this great study of nuns has to do uh, with the essay they wrote in the late 1930s, about 140 nuns. The bishop asked them to write an essay about why they were entering the convent. And about half the nuns used one positive emotion word, like, I'm eager to serve Jesus. And the other half uh, completely deadpan about it. Uh, more than 60 years later, the researchers came back and asked who was alive and who was dead. At, at, I don't have the data with me, but this is approximately right. At age 85, 
90% of the nuns who used one positive emotion word were alive versus 52% of the nuns who used none. And at age 94, 50% of the nuns who used one positive emotion word were alive versus 12% who use none. And that is, this, I'm not pulling these findings out at random. There is a growing literature, which I'm very interested in, on the relationship of uh, PERMA to uh, living longer, lower morbidity, lower health care expenditure. Uh, so that's, those are a couple of things you wouldn't have known before. And let me just tell you something about the question, can you raise your positive emotion? Uh, so, uh, I said in the spirit of uh, the research I do, the ultimate research, I've spent a lot of my life working on drugs and psychotherapy and what works. And there's a gold standard methodology for that. It's the random assignment placebo controlled test. And when I started to work on happiness, I asked, uh, could you apply random assignment placebo controlled testing to the 200 uh, stories from the Buddha to pop psychology that have been told about can you be happier? And uh, so when I, I'm about to tell you an exercise, when I tell you an exercise that works, it means it's been through random assignment placebo controlled testing, so it actually works. So here's one. Um, every night for the next week, here's, this is your assignment, uh, write down three things that went well today and why they went well. Uh, turns out, six months later, if you start to do that, you statistically have less depression, less anxiety, and higher life satisfaction. And importantly, it's addicting, that people like doing positive psychology exercises. Uh, uh, unlike psychotherapy, in psychotherapy, how many of you are psychotherapists? Uh, one of the, the dirty little secrets of psych, I've a, been a psychotherapist m most of my life. One of the dirty little secrets is that when we teach a patient something, its effectiveness is measured by how long it stays before it melts to zero. So for the most part, what we teach in psychotherapy and in our pharmacology goes away in time. Uh, positive psychology exercises are self-reinforcing. So that's um, the first one, P. Uh, engagement, being one with the music, being in flow, using your signature strengths. So in order to uh, begin to ask the question, how can you have more flow in life, we had to uh, devise reliable instruments to measure in children and adults what their highest strengths are. And by the way, these are available for free at uh, AuthenticHappiness.org. Part of my job has been to give this stuff away. And so you can go to this website with your class, with your children or yourself, take the Signature Strengths Test and identify, compared to roughly two million people, uh, what your Signature Strengths are uh, and how they rank. Let me just tell you, these Signature Strengths are moral strengths. They're not talents. These are things that are valued in their own right, like gratitude, kindness, sense of humor, uh, and the like. And uh, let me just give you an example of uh, what's been found out about using signature strengths as a builder of well-being. So um, if, we were, if this was an overnight workshop, here is what I'd do. Tonight you would go to the website and you'd find out what your highest strength is might be something, Stephen, like social intelligence. Uh, and then your job, and I'll do, I'll do the exercise now, close your eyes, think of something you don't like doing at work that you pretty much have to do at least once a week. Okay, open your eyes. Having found out what your signature strength is, what you're asked to do is to do that task using your highest strength. And so, for example, one of my students was a uh, beggar at Gennardi. Do you have people who put, uh, at supermarkets, who put the things in your bags? Okay, well, that's what, that's what she did. She didn't like doing it. She was working her way through school. Uh, and her highest strength was social intelligence. 
So her job was to recraft bagging using her highest strength. So she decided that she would make the encounter with her the social highlight of every customer's day. Now importantly, she failed at that uh, with a lot of the customers, but she put what was best inside of her on offer all the time. And begging became a lot easier after that. And in fact, when people do this, when they take something they don't like doing and find a way next week of doing it using their highest strength, it's addicting. Uh, you don't, you don't need, if, if kindness is your highest strength and you start using it in the office, uh, you, people like you more, you get along better, and it, it's self-reinforcing. And six months later, statistically, you're less depressed, less anxious, and higher life satisfaction. Uh, now, while, while we're on signature strengths, I want to say something about uh, teaching and character. I'm very interested both in the character of students, and I'll tell you more about that later, but I'm fascinated by the character of teachers and of good teachers. How many of you are teachers? Okay, well, this is especially for you. Uh, the wandering starts with the question of what is it we're really trying to teach our kids? And I don't believe it's spelling and geometry. I believe these are the media through which we're trying to teach three much more basic elements. Uh, the first is social navigation how to get an adult to like you, how to get along with peers. And I think uh, when we teach, that's a, a gloss underneath it all. The second is rhetoric. It's an old, old word, but a real thing. Rhetoric is how to tell a good story, how to write a good story, how to ask the right questions, how to put uh, the people you're talking to in touch with what's best inside of them. So I think rhetoric is the second thing we're trying to teach. And the third and most important is I believe we are trying to teach good character. And I'll say more about that uh, in a bit. Uh, I mentioned the VIA signature strengths and the children's strengths. And uh, I'll take you back to character and children in a moment. But I want to tell you something about uh, great teachers and the right-hand side of the report card en route. So um, my... Uh, David Levin is the uh, president of the 120 KIPP schools in the United States. These are charter schools for the poorest black kids in America. And they've been having terrific success with this. It's a positive education school, set of schools. And they give the usual left-hand side of the report card grades. But what they also do now is they've identified eight characteristics character strengths of uh, kindergarten through seventh grade children that they want to build. Zest, grit, self-discipline, uh, interpersonal self-discipline, optimism, gratitude, social intelligence, and curiosity. So each child, every semester, is rated on these strengths. And so, for example, for Zest, each child is rated on actively participates, from one to five, shows enthusiasm, and invigorates others. And discussions with the children and with the parents uh, are often around the building of character. And I think very importantly, once you say there's a number you want, and if, if you don't measure the right thing, you do, don't do the right thing. But once you start to measure something, it goes up. People are interested in it. And character is one of those things. Um, so that's a snapshot of what uh, uh, quite a few schools in America are starting to do that may be useful to South Australia. Uh, it's a wonderful conversation starter with parents, by the way. Uh, now, uh, we're interested in, this is a complicated slide, but it, it basically tells you two messages. These are the 24 character strengths that we believe are humanly universal. And when they occur close to each other, this is based on about 100,000 people. So this is a very meaningful slide. It means people who have fairness also tend to be modest. If they occur far apart, it means people who are modest tend to be people who have low zest. So 
So this sort of tells you uh, what co-occurs. And the second thing that's in this slide is different professions. So we looked at four different professions and we asked, where are the practitioners of those professions located? So it turns out teachers tend to have this grouping of gratitude, love, kindness, and forgiveness. Unlike professors who don't have any of those things, uh, they have creativity, love of learning, bravery, and perspective. CEOs, we find, have zest and hope, and administrators don't have that. They've got prudence, honesty, fairness, and, and modesty. So that's a description of character strengths of people in different professions. But notice this doesn't distinguish good teachers from bad teachers. So we ask the question, uh, what distinguishes the character strengths of great teachers from everyone else? And uh, that very surprising to me. Uh, the two strengths that distinguish great teachers from the rest of us are zest and humor. And the reason I mention this is I'm going to talk in about 20 minutes about a vision for South Australia in which uh, I talk about the teaching profession. And one of the things embodied in that is the notion that in the same way that in teacher education we teach teachers how to teach geometry, we can teach teachers how to teach well-being, and I think we should, but more than that, we should take what's known about great teachers. Uh, humor and zest are teachable, and uh, we should select for and teach those things. Um, Okay, so what we've gone through so far is positive emotion and engagement, relationships, um, active constructive responding. Your uh, spouse comes home from work. Uh, are any of you marriage counselors? Okay, uh, marriage counseling is the worst form of therapy. Uh, people are lying to you, they're lying to each other. Uh, and its statistics on success are abysmal. Uh, I teach marriage counseling, I've done marriage and sex counseling, and a really tough form of therapy. Uh, what you try to do, what we teach our, our marriage counselors to do, is to uh, teach couples not to have the same fight over and over and over again. Uh, what you're trying to do essentially is to take insufferable marriages and make them barely tolerable. Um, about seven years ago, Shelley Gable, who will actually be speaking in Sydney uh, next week, made an important discovery about marriage counseling. And it's n about not teaching couples how about fighting, but teaching couples about celebrating together. And this is not only true of marriages, but it's true of friendship and corporations as well. So your spouse comes home from work and she's been promoted. What do you say to her? Uh, well, it turns out what I used to say to my wife in these circumstances was passive constructive, which is, uh, congratulations, dear, you deserve it. That has no effect on anything. Uh, I teach drill sergeants. Uh, we've graduated our 7,000th drill sergeant recently. Drill sergeants are active destructive. They say, y you know what tax bracket your promotion's going to put us into? Um, many of us are passive destructive, which is uh, what's for dinner. Uh, it turns out the only thing that works, and when couples learn to do it, love, loyalty, commitment increase, the probability of divorce goes down, is active constructive. And that's, uh, darling, I, I read that last paper you sent to the company on the pension plan. That was the single best paper. I've read on fiscal matters in my 25 years in business. Now, would you relive what happened? Exactly where were you when your boss told you you had been promoted? She tells you exactly what did he say. Uh, what do you think the real reasons you've been promoted are? How can you use those strengths more at church or with the kids or in our marriage? Uh, let's go open a bottle of champagne. So that's when couples learn to do that it increases the positives. So that's an important discovery. Uh, meaning, uh, belonging to and serving something you think is bigger than you are. 
Now, none of you probably need to be told that this is an ineluctable form of human uh, desire, but your children do need to be told this. So your children probably think life is about things and shopping, uh, and the economy runs on that. Um, and uh, so we have a set of exercises that build meaning and purpose in children and adults. And one of them is uh, uh, when we, it, we have people write their own vision of a positive human future, and then they write their obituary uh, and through their grandchild's eyes about what they did to bring about a positive human future. We don't call it a life, we call it a life summary when we're dealing with depressed people. And that's a very good way of increasing uh, 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 meaning and purpose. Um, finally, for this part of the lecture, the A, accomplishment. So we're very interested in predicting high accomplishment in young people in the classroom. And uh, in our typical experiments, these are done by Angela Duckworth, uh, we measure self-discipline and grit. Grit is extreme persistence. Who, who rings the doorbell in every uh, house in Adelaide? Extreme grit, extreme persistence. And we're interested in the relationship of self-discipline and grit versus IQ and talent to success in life. And the bottom line message of this, all these studies is that self-discipline is about twice as important statistically as how smart you are, as IQ for measures of success. And again, for those of us who are teachers, that's a very important message. So let me summarize what I've said in the first uh, half of what I wanted to talk about. I've said flourishing in an adult or a child consists of PERMA, positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishment. These are well measured these days, and they can be increased, both in uh, adults and in children. Uh, and we did it with individuals, and now the question is, uh, does it work in bigger organizations? Uh, so uh, for the last 20 years, uh, we've been working in schools. And we started in individual classrooms, and we found that when we taught the principles of positive psychology to uh, children, typically 10 to 12 year old children in the classroom, and then watched them over the next two years as they went through puberty, that the probability of depression and anxiety uh, markedly decreased. Uh, there have been 21 replications across the world, including a large government re replication in Whitehall recently. These are controlled experiments, so these have ma matched and sometimes randomly assigned control groups. And importantly, the samples in these studies are diverse. So uh, we do it with uh, uh, wealthy kids at Geelong Grammar, at St. Peter's, uh, at Riverdale, uh, and with very poor kids uh, in Harlem and North Philadelphia. We work with uh, uh, the local, wealthy local authorities in England, uh, such as Hertfordshire, and the poorest local authorities, South, South Tyneside. Uh, Beijing, uh, London, Philadelphia as well. And uh, when we started to do this, it was my graduate students who taught uh, positive psychology to kids, but we soon realized that that was a, a dead end since I only have a few dozen graduate students. So the question was, could we teach teachers to teach positive psychology to kids, and what would the results be? So about a decade ago, we developed a 10-day course for teachers, uh, and we put teachers through it, and then they started to teach it, and we compared teachers to my PhD students, and the teachers did at least as well as the PhD students. So that's very important. This is led successfully by teachers, and in this program, kids learn to handle stressors and setbacks, they learn realistic optimism, they learn assertiveness rather than aggressiveness, they learn decision making. and. Um, here are uh, uh, some non-unrepresentative results. These are, um, and I'll refer to the, this design later on, this is a, a setting in which we integrate 
positive psychology into ninth grade literature. So in this setting, uh, uh, four classes of literature are given literature as usual. A literature, ninth grade literature in the United States is Death of the Salesman, Scarlet Letter, uh, Lord of the Flies, Macbeth, one tragedy after another. Uh, and uh, so what we do is when you read Lord of the Flies, uh, on Friday you have 80 minutes on kindness and generosity. And then the next Wednesday your assignment is to do three kind things and write them up. And that goes through 24 weeks. And then we rate the kids for the rest of their high school life who have been through this compared to literature as usual without this. And what we find is that uh, on social skills, these are rated blindly by teachers who don't know what course they've been through. The kids who have had literature with positive psychology have higher social skills. They have, very importantly for us, they have more love of learning and zest, and uh, their grades are higher over the next couple of years. Not in honors English, Every, we have grade inflation, so everyone gets an A, but in, in real English courses, their grades are then higher. Um, and uh, this is being pursued vigorously in uh, uh, the English-speaking world. So there are three local authorities in England who are, uh, have trained uh, hundreds of teachers who are teaching this in the UK. Uh, Anthony Selden at Wellington is uh, the leading person in independent schools in England. The KIPP schools uh, for poor black kids in the United States. Riverdale, which is uh, the equivalent of uh, St. Peter's or Geelong Grammar for New York City. Uh, and then the hugest intervention was initiated by Stephen Meek, the headmaster of Geelong Grammar, when four years ago uh, he said uh, uh, he wanted to train his entire staff, and so Penn's faculty came for 10 days to Geelong Grammar, and the entire uh, staff over the last couple of years has been trained in positive psychology, and they have spread it K through 12 through uh, uh, Geelong Grammar School. And now we have a partnership between St. Peter's College in Adelaide and Mount Barker High School to uh, teach the entire staff the students and the faculty these skills. And let me tell you what St. Peter's is up to in this regard. Uh, it's led by Matthew White and Simon Murray. So they are rigorously measuring for the entire faculty, the entire staff, the kitchen people as well, and all the students, uh, the basic elements of PERMA. In uh, July, the University of Pennsylvania will come to uh, St. Peter's Adelaide. The faculty will receive training uh, and probably uh, the next uh, January as well. And uh, we'll ask the question over time, what happens to staff and students? And by the way, one thing I should mention, which uh, is easy to slip by, is that when we teach this uh, to faculty, uh, to teachers, uh, we have good results that students are less depressed and less anxious over the next few years, but the big effect is on teachers themselves. This is a rejuvenating experience. Uh, it's very common for teachers to say, this is why I went into teaching in the first place. Uh, and uh, going back to St. Peter's, Matthew White in St. Peter's uh, and Lee Waters have measured uh, this is a profile of school well-being before for the senior school before all this starts. So we'll have a good baseline to ask the question, what happens to PERMA over the next few years as the faculty, the staff, and the students learn it? Um, and I want to say a few words, you, you may find some of these uncongenial, about integrating the principles of positive psychology into class. Now, we typically do standalone courses. So there is a, a curriculum for teaching PERMA directly in a standalone uh, 12 one and a half hour sessions. By the way, there are teaching manuals for all of this. This is not seat of the pants. This is scripted with PowerPoint and the like. 
But the question arises, do you have to do this by standalone or can you integrate it into class? Well, I mentioned uh, it's there uh, been integrated into ninth grade literature in which character analysis is uh, of the strengths of uh, characters pervades the analysis of literature. Uh, kids, in addition to reading the usual tragedies that get assigned, uh, uh, learn about PERMA, about human strengths, and they're given assignments to practice human strengths as well. Um, history. My, my oldest daughter is a, a professor of history. History, as you probably know, in the hands of uh, our deconstructionist friends, are, is taught as one damn thing after another. In America, it's first we killed the Indians, and we enslaved the blacks, and then we killed people in uh, Europe and in Iraq and Afghanistan, just one awful thing after another. Um, well, what's missing from the teaching of history is the notion of human progress. And I think you have to be blinded by ideology not to see that over the last 3,000 years, by any criterion you can think of, there has been enormous human progress. Um, the book of the year last year, by the way, I think is uh, Steven Pinker's uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature. So what Steven does is to look at your probability of being a violently dying across the last 3,000 years. So as best we can tell, your probability of violently dying 2,000 years ago was between 1 in 10 and 1 in 30. Uh, your probability of uh, violently dying in uh, 1960, uh, even with World War I and World War II, had gone down to something like 1 in 100. And now, the probability of violently dying is something like 1 in 300. Pinker has argued that just taking violence as a marker, that uh, there has been huge progress in human empathy and human love and human kindness. So history, I think, can be taught, uh, or at least sprinkled, with the hope of human progress. Um, social studies. Um, in social studies, routinely when geography becomes uh, social, uh, social studies, we measure famine and air pollution throughout the world, and I think that's worth doing. I spend a lot of my time measuring well-being throughout the world and uh, how, how, what its relationship is to wealth, for example. And so in teaching of social studies, one can not only ask questions of how is misery spread across the world and what do we know, but about well-being and its contagion. So that's, those are, uh, and biology is another one to mention. Uh, so when we teach uh, uh, third graders about the brain, I, I think you have a curriculum that comes out of Canberra about that, uh, the brain is connected to the emotions, to positive and negative emotion. And it's perfectly possible to teach third year three kids about uh, the biology of positive emotion and the biology of negative emotion as well. Similarly, at uh, the junior and, uh, year 11 and year 12 biology, we routinely teach kids Darwin and individual selection, but very little group selection has been taught. And group selection is the great energizer for the positive virtues. Uh, so that's an example of uh, what, what can be taught here. And, and um, it, what, if this gets adopted, it is very natural for you as a parent uh, or parents to come to you and say, well, you know, if, if South Australia, as I'm going to suggest, should adopt the teaching of well-being as a serious endeavor for teachers, the question is, what's in it for my child? And so let me tell you the state of the evidence that I think you can responsibly say to parents, which uh, St. Peter's is saying to parents, I'll be meeting with 800 parents tomorrow uh, to talk about this. Um, here's what we know. It is virtually certain that by the teaching of PERMA in school, you will increase PERMA in the child. You essentially teach those skills and those are learned. Uh, uh, there are at least 21 good replications in which uh, depression 
as you go through puberty is less probable in children when they've learned these resilience skills so that likely they'll have less depression. Similarly, it's likely they'll have less anxiety. Um, several of the 21 replications look at conduct and discipline, and they find, as does the Army, and I'll tell you that in a minute, that uh, better conduct occurs as a result of learning PERMA. And so it's possible, uh, higher grades are possible, and uh, more success in life is possible. Uh, the representative, I'm not pulling this, this is not seat of the pants, so uh, we do things like we look at the upper 10% of University of Illinois graduates uh, on well-being, on life satisfaction. Uh, we know their parents' income and their grades. We come back 15 years later and we ask how much money are they earning? And it turns the upper 10% in well-being, co-varying out parental income and grades, earns about $15,000 more a year than the rest of the population. Uh, and finally, and this is what I spend a great deal of my time doing, there is good reason to think that the PERMA resilience skills are related to uh, lower mortality, lower morbidity, uh, lower health care expenditure across the lifespan. So we're, we're quite sure about this in adults. I, I spend a lot of time working on cardiovascular disease and death in uh, uh, older people, and we find that the, that the PERMA variables are protectors, health assets, over and above the usual risk factors. So for example, being in the bottom quartile, of, if you're a 65-year-old man and you're in the bottom quartile of optimism, that is, you're a pessimist, co-varying out uh, other variables, uh, your risk of dying of cardiovascular disease in the next decade is about three times that of the optimists. Being a pessimist is about equivalent to smoking two and a half packs of cigarettes a day, statistically. Uh, so the last uh, two things I want to talk about are the question of, of large organizations. So um, uh, three years ago, the Chief of Staff of the United States Army came to the University of Pennsylvania and they had read our stuff on teaching and uh, they said, uh, Chief of Staff said, well you teach teachers the skills of resilience and you measure their students and you find less depression, less anxiety, better conduct. The Army has 40,000 teachers, the drill sergeants. So your job, Dr. Seligman, will be to teach all the drill sergeants the skills of PERMA and they will teach the entire United States Army and we will rigorously measure uh, the changes in uh, the variables that interest the United States Army. And that's what they've done. Uh, just a couple of samples of what I'm allowed to show you about this. In order to uh, begin this, we had to create a scale of psychological fitness. The aim of the Chief of Staff was to create an army that was just as psychologically fit as physically fit. The army measures the unfitnesses, but uh, we had to create a 105 item test uh, that all 1.1 million soldiers take every year uh, on emotional fitness, social fitness, family fitness, and spiritual fitness, meaning and purpose in life, as well as the usual risk factors. And we started to use this scale to see if you can predict what's going to happen in the Army. This is just one sample. Uh, there are 1,200 colonels every year, who, uh, of whom 33 are promoted to general, to brigadier general. And the question is, can you predict who's going to do it? Uh, who's going to get promoted? And the answer is robustly yes, that uh, those of you who can read these correlations, uh, these tell you who's going to get promoted to general. Uh, we've graduated our 7,000th drill sergeants. The drill sergeants now go out into the field during deployment and they teach positive psychology. And so we're measuring the soldiers and we measure them through deployment. That is, and this is Iraq, Afghanistan, the real thing. And you can see that soldiers who have at least one trained teacher per company uh, get, bet, let's see, this is catastrophic thinking, but it's represented. They have less catastrophic thinking as they go through Iran 
and uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and compared to the controls who get worse. And in uh, June, the Army will publish its data on suicide, PTSD, and attrition. I uh, will hear more about that. And, and so uh, I want to come to my conclusion. What I've argued at this point is that um, well-being and happiness have gone from being flaky, unmeasurable notions to measurable ones, uh, PERMA. Each of these things uh, can be measured with reasonable reliability. There is reason to think that at the individual level, you can raise PERMA. And better yet, when teachers are taught the skills of raising PERMA, uh, the depression, anxiety of their students goes down statistically, and uh, their well-being goes up. And this is being implemented in uh, schools across the English-speaking world, uh, and most importantly, in a giant organization, the US Army, with success. And so this brings me to what can we hope for South Australia? And why am I here in South Australia? And, and the reason is no one has ever tried this in an entire state. That is, can we create a state in which the, the adults and the children of South Australia are flourishing more than they would be otherwise? And it seems to me there are three ways of doing this. And, and this is uh, uh, my vision about what could happen if you have the political will to do this. Uh, and these are not fantastically expensive, by the way. The first is to measure the well-being of every child in South Australia. Now, off the shelf, we can now measure the well-being of nine-year-olds on up, and uh, uh, work is needed below the age of nine. But we could start, as St. Peter's is doing, uh, to measure the well-being of every kid in Australia nine years old and, and older. Now, this kind of measurement is important. I work with uh, the Prime Minister of England, and as you may know, uh, he campaigned on a global well-being uh, campaign in which he said that um, GDP uh, is in the service of well-being. And so he has decided to measure the well-being of uh, the entire UK uh, and most importantly to hold himself accountable for public policy by changes in well-being. So the measurement of well-being of every child in Australia becomes important about public accountability, about education and child development, because that is one of the benchmarks against which we would measure the success of education. So that's number one. No, number two is the notion of immunization. One of my mentors was Jonas Salk, and uh, the inventor of a polio vaccine. And toward the end of his life, Jonas said to me, that if he could do it over again, he would immunize children again, but he'd do it psychologically rather than biologically. Now, what I've said over the last half hour is there is good reason to believe that we can teach children these immunization skills. We can teach kids the skills of PERMA, and that has two effects. One, it increases well-being, and two, it fights the mental illnesses. Remember I said the basic data in this field is a decrease in depression, anxiety, and bad conduct as these kids go through puberty. So there is the possibility that uh, South Australia could, as part of teaching, take on the teaching of well-being throughout its schools and using the measurement of well-being as well as the routine measures of mental illness as accountability. And I should also mention, this isn't just for teachers. I spent $2.7 million with uh, my Department of Education to create parental programs. So there is a program for the teaching of parents these skills. And we find that when you teach both the teachers and the parents, the kids do better. Uh, and finally, um, I believe that by integrating the teaching of well-being into the the, the bloodstream of teacher education that uh, we can make well-being, uh, we can entrench the notion of well-being uh, into South Australia, into the future of its children. So let me summarize what I've said today. I've said well-being is measurable, it consists in PERMA, 
It's teachable, it can be taught to children, and if South Australia is bold enough to take on the immunization of its children against mental illness and the building of PERMA, that I think uh, there is an unprecedented opportunity for the state of South Australia. Thank you. Um, thank you. That was a tremendous presentation and a real uh, invitation and call to arms, I think, and a great beginning for our day's work. But before we go on to uh, morning tea, I think we've got time for about three questions, three or four questions. We've got a microphone down here and a microphone here. Sadly, it won't be many questions, but uh, Martin is available to take some questions. So if anybody would like to ask one, please come forward right now to either of the microphones. Hello, Martin. My name's Karen James. I'm from the Department of Education and Child Development. Um, thank you for your presentation. It was very um, interesting and illuminating and you know, very skills focused. My question really is just about thinking about our relationships with our physical bodies. And I know that in your presentation you were talking very much about mental health. But have you also thought about, I guess, opportunities to build strategies that encourage children and young people to think about the care of their physical body? and their relationship with their sense of um, physical self. I mean, we've got issues around nutrition, physical activity, children's safety, so the physical aspect of our lives as well. Well, o o only indirectly, Karen. So uh, uh, m my interest has been in what is the relationship of building psychological fitness to physical fitness. And so uh, uh, between the lines, what you may have seen up here is I work with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation on the question of health assets psychologically and their relationship to uh, physical health. And so uh, within the United States Army study, we have now measured the psychological fitness of 1.1 million uh, health, fairly healthy men and women, and we're marrying the entire physical database going forward. So we're asking the question, if you build or if you have uh, a good marriage, for example, and then you get uh, an infectious illness, do you need less antibiotic mm -hmm. to cure it? We're asking about the contagion of well-being. We're asking uh, uh, what is the relationship between the optimism and the building of optimism to cardiovascular death. So the the part of your question that interests me is I think there is increasingly good reason to believe that when we increase psychological fitness, when we increase PERMA, what we get downstream is uh, a better physical shape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I guess I was also wondering if there's an opportunity when we're thinking about well-being and building it into the curriculum whether we could actually include an aspect that focuses on our physical health or yeah, sense of physical well-being. Uh, and well, one more piece of data that's become apparent. Uh, part of what we do is we look at exercise versus obesity mm. on cardiovascular disease longitudinally. And contrary to what you see in headlines, exercise is probably twice as important statistically as body mass mm. for uh, mm. uh, uh, cardiovascular consequences. So that's the kind of thing that yeah. uh, the, the literature is telling us about. Oh, hi, uh, Martin. Thanks for your presentation. It's been um, fantastic having you here. Um, I, my question is, is to do with a religi religion as, or religios religiousness as part of the kind of PERMA profile. Um, what hope is there for people who aren't, you know, in a, in a conventional religion and how does that relate to the sort of sense of things bigger than yourself? Well, I think that's a very important question and one I'm quite interested in. So uh, first let me take you back 15 years into the, the health and religion literature. And uh, basically what that literature looked like was, uh, if you think about the M in PERMA, meaning and purpose, religion is a very common way people get meaning and purpose in life, uh, that uh, 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 religious people probably have uh, more hope, more optimism, perhaps less depression. So we looked at, uh, I will get around to mm -hmm. th those of us who are not religious in a moment. So we looked at uh, 11 major, and you're not going to like these results, uh, American religions. And we looked at uh, the 
uh, optimism, depression uh, in its adherence. And we found that the more fundamentalist the religion, the more hope and optimism people had. So uh, 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 fundamentalist Catholics, uh, fundamentalist Protestants, uh, Orthodox Muslims were uh, less depressed, more hopeful than Reformed Jews and uh, Unitarians who were depressed and pes pessimistic. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's where the literature was about 15 years ago. Now, in the Army database, we're not, by the First Amendment, we're not allowed to ask about religion. So we ask about meaning and purpose. And uh, I can give you a hint of the data that the Pentagon will, will publish. Uh, I, I've spent a lot of my life working on suicide. And uh, no, suicide is a mess. No one's ever been able to predict it. And that's because no one has ever had a large number of suicides, all of whom took the same test. Uh, well, last year we had 84 soldiers who killed themselves uh, and 800,000 who didn't, all of whom took my test. So we could ask the question, could you predict who was going to kill themselves? And the answer is you really can, statistically. And it's the meaning and purpose questions that play a large role. So if you're in the bottom 1% of my life has meaning and the bottom 1% of my work in the Army has meaning, you are, that's a red flag for suicide. Now that's probably not a religious question. It's probably a question of meaning and purpose. So I believe that being part of something larger, a political party, the Boy Scouts, a religion, environmentalism, uh, that these are the positive institutions that give us meaning and are great buffers and consolation against the mental illnesses and ill health. So I think religion is one route and there are plenty of other secular routes to being part of something larger than the self. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Martin. We've got one last question. Hi, I'm Jodie Benvenis, the Director of Parent Wellbeing. I run its parenting website and I run parenting programs. My question is, um, I've followed your work over many years and it's been really interesting to see how you started with the idea of um, the positive and, and the coined the term of happiness and authentic happiness and you've now broadened your concept to well-being and PERMA, which I think is a, a great development because it's a lot broader and a much more interesting concept. Um, my question is, and there's been a lot of chatter within the positive psychology um, community about the relative importance of the different aspects of PERMA, and I'm just wondering whether you can comment on that and whether there's um, certain aspects of PERMA that are more important for flourishing or whether they're equally important. Yeah, the, the answer is, for me, the question is itself a confusion. And, and here's, here's how my thinking has evolved. So I used to think that the final common path of the positive side of life was happiness and life satisfaction. But I've come to believe because of the genetics of happiness and life satisfaction and its relative unmovability that that is not the final common path uh, and that there is no final common path. So what I mean by that is if you think about an airplane, uh, the dashboard on an airplane has wind speed, altitude, uh, fuel gauge, uh, 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 and depending on the mission, different gauges are what matters. I think human, what human beings choose to do is an even more complicated dashboard. And that, that there's five elements on the dashboard. And depending on your mission and your values, flourishing might consist in very different combinations. So I don't have a final, a one number final common path. Now th this has become a, quite an important argument in the UK. So my friend Richard Laird, an economist, uh, in the spirit of GDP at the dollar as a final common path, is arguing that life satisfaction is the final common path and that policy should be around life satisfaction. I think it should be around PERMA all five, and that depending on the values of individuals and the values of a nation, different dials on the dashboard will matter. 
Thank you very much, Martin. I think uh, everyone's just about ready for morning tea. Before we go to morning tea, I'd like to thank you, Martin. That was a wonderful presentation.